advantage not to have your Bible open this evening at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and at the passage which was our scripture reading beginning at verse 13. In our recent series of Sunday evening sermons on the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have already considered the themes of his virgin birth, his perfect life, his atoning death, and his bodily resurrection. And this evening, our theme is his personal return. And I need to explain to you right away what we mean by that. God's purpose in history, of which Scripture is the authoritative guide for us, God's purpose in history is not achieved by a gradual evolution or an imperceptible unfolding of his purposes. It is achieved rather by decisive epoch-making events which mark the purposes of God, as it were, mark the footsteps of God in history. Sometimes they are cataclysmic events, but always they are decisive, epoch-making events by which God is achieving His purpose in the unfolding history of the world. It was so at the creation of the world at the beginning and its destruction at the flood. It was so in the call of Abraham and in the exodus of God's people out of Egypt. It was so in the birth and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. These were all epoch-making events in which God is marching onwards to achieve the purposes that He has set in His mind in history. And the Bible tells us that the consummation and climax of all history and of all the purposes of God will be accompanied by the most decisive of all historical events, namely, the return to this world of the Lord Jesus Christ in power and great glory. That will be the final event of history. At that point, God's purposes will have come to their climax. And in the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will come to what the Bible simply calls the day, or the day of the Lord. But a day which will bring history to its climax. Now, in this passage which we read this evening, and it's really important for us, I think, to stick closely to Scripture in our thinking about this theme this evening, in this passage, you might have noticed that there are two phrases used to describe Christ's return, one in chapter 4 and the other in chapter 5. If you look at your Bible in chapter 4, verse 15, it is described as the coming of the Lord. In chapter 5, verse 2, it is described as the day of the Lord. The first of these lays emphasis on the nature of Jesus' return. What is going to happen on that occasion? It is in some ways a descriptive term. It is the word that some of you may know from the Greek because it has almost found its way into the English language, the word parousia. 
And this is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second of these phrases, the day of the Lord, speaks to us more of the purpose or significance of his return. Why is he coming back? What is the significance of this cataclysmic event at the end of the ages? And especially, how should we prepare for it? Now in this particular section of 1 Thessalonians, a part of the Bible which is just full of teaching about the return of Jesus, and indeed the whole Bible is, this is not a theme which is the preserve of a few people who happen to be interested in that kind of thing. This is one of the dominant themes of Holy Scripture. And here the Apostle is dealing with the theme in relation, first of all, to physical death and the problem of bereavement. And in that context, he speaks of the coming of the Lord. Notice in verse 13 of chapter 4, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. So he is speaking about the fact of physical death and the problem of bereavement. In the second little section from chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 11, he is teaching us about the second coming of Christ in relation to moral darkness and the problem of judgment. Chapter 5, at the beginning, now brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you brothers are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. So he goes on to say, therefore live, not as though you were in darkness, but as those who walk in the light. Both paragraphs, did you notice while we were reading them, end with the same exhortation. In verse 18 of chapter 4, therefore encourage each other with these words. Chapter 5 verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. So the whole purpose of this teaching, both in relation to death and the problem of bereavement, and in relation to darkness and the problem of judgment, is to encourage God's people. And Paul says, encourage each other with these words. So he means to renew us through this teaching, to give us a new vision, to give us a new sense of the sheer wonder of God's purpose in history, in the world, and chiefly in his people. Let's look then First at this phrase in chapter 4, verse 15, the coming of the Lord and how the apostle develops it. Now I need to explain to you the particular problem about death and bereavement which Paul is here answering. The Thessalonian Christians, you see, were not in doubt about the fact of Christ's return. That was something which they acknowledged and accepted. But many of them had a shadow over the fact of Christ's return for this simple reason. They were concerned about many of their fellow believers who had already died. And they looked forward to that day. They thought of it as the day when the Lord Jesus would return in glory and every eye would see him and they would be caught up to reign with him forever. But they said, what about our brothers and sisters in Christ who have already died? Are they somehow or other going to be disadvantaged? Will they lose something of the glory of the Lord's return because they have died before he returns? And here Paul turns to answer this whole issue of their 
bereavement for this very specialized reason. Now he answers it in verses 13 following, not by saying that they must not grieve, but rather that they must not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Because it is precisely into this realm of death and bereavement and separation and loss that the doctrine of the personal return of Christ penetrates. It is precisely here that it is something of enormous relevance to say to us. And he says, what I am saying to you brothers is we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Because I hope you are aware of the fact that pagan grief can be an infinitely sad thing because it is infinitely hopeless. You discover that in all sorts of places, in life, in literature, in every corner of the world, pagan death is a profoundly sad thing for the simple reason that it is profoundly hopeless. One of the places where it comes out most penetratingly is in Shakespeare. If you know your Shakespeare reasonably well, you'll know that there is scarcely a place to which you can turn without discovering Shakespeare giving voice to this sense of the utter hopelessness of pagan death. You get it in Hamlet, of course, as he ponders the fact of death and people returning to dust and the sheer hopelessness of great men and emperors becoming clay that is used for the most debased purposes. You get it in more poignant form and measure for measure. Listen to this. I but to die and go we know not where to lie in cold obstruction and to rot the weariest and most loathed worldly life that age, ache, penury and imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death. Now Paul has the answer to that pagan grief in the three saving events of Jesus' mission. Do you notice how from verse 14 he goes on to unfold them? We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. What are these three events? They are first that Jesus died, second that Jesus rose again, Thirdly, that Jesus is coming again and bringing his saints with him. By his death, do you see, he dealt with the sting of death. That thing which makes death truly awesome and dreadful and horrifying. And the sting of death is sin. But by his death, Jesus has dealt with death's sting and drawn it. By his resurrection, he has demolished the power of death and openly and publicly declared that he has triumphed over it. And by his return in glory, he will bring the souls of believers who have died to be united to a resurrection body. And in these three areas of the work of Christ, we have the ultimate answer to the pagan hopelessness of death. Now do you see how you need all three of these to give the Christian believer the reality of the Christian hope? It is not only that Christ has drawn death's sting. It is not only that he has triumphed over death's reign. 
It is also that he is returning and bringing the souls of believers which have been separated by death from their bodies on the day of his appearing to be reunited with a resurrected body in which they will be liberated to serve and worship God. Now, this is Paul's doctrine. This is his teaching to answer the desperate despair of the ancient world. And you will notice how he works this out in relation to the Thessalonian Christians' problem. In verse 15, According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now you see his answer. The Thessalonian Christians were concerned about those who had fallen asleep, that is, who had died before the coming of the Lord. Now he says, when the Lord comes, we who are still alive will not go before those who have fallen asleep. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So he is giving them an assurance concerning their loved ones who are already asleep that far from being disadvantaged, they will rise first when Christ comes. And in the context of explaining this, he gives to us the four events that make up what will happen when the Lord Jesus Christ returns in glory. Verses 16 to 17 are closely packed with truth. Let me invite you to follow them with me. The first of these events is the return. That is the return of Jesus. Verse 16 at the beginning. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The return is, of course, firstly a personal return. The Lord himself will come down from heaven. Now, what Paul is emphasizing, you see, is that it is the same Jesus, the same Jesus whom they knew here on earth, the same Jesus who was born as a baby in Bethlehem, who walked around the roads of Galilee, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, who was raised and walked amongst them and spoke with them after his resurrection, and whom they saw ascending into heaven. And God sent his angelic messengers to tell them precisely this. This same Jesus, he said, whom you have seen going into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go. So it is not another Jesus. It is not the spirit of Jesus. It is this same Jesus, the incarnate, exalted Redeemer, who is at God's right hand. It will be his personal return in glory which will be marked in this event. Now that means, you see, that we cannot say that the return of Jesus is the return of Jesus simply to live in the lives of his people. It is not the return of Jesus to occupy and inhabit the hearts of believers. This is an historical, visible, public personal, literal, bodily return of the same Jesus who went into heaven when he ascended on high. And Paul makes it abundantly clear, the Lord himself will come down. Now you notice how he will come down. At his first coming, he came privately and quietly. He came in an obscure corner of the world, and hardly anybody was there when he came. But when he comes again, do you notice, this is going to be a public occasion. 
Verse 16, He will come down from heaven with a loud command. That is an authoritative voice. Scholars say that the words really refer to the kind of language that is spoken when a monarch comes in amongst his subjects. You may know what happens when there is a buzz of conversation at the mansion house in London and the Queen perhaps is coming in and there is a voice that rings through the buzz of conversation and other activity. Pray silence for the Queen. And a hush falls upon the place. My dear friends, that is the palest, palest shadow of what is going to happen when the voice of God rips through the universe and cries, Behold, your King! And every knee will bow before Him. And every tongue will cry out, Jesus Christ is Lord. You will cry that that day. That will be on my lips on that day. Whatever language you speak, that's what you will employ it to say. And it will not only be a day when he will return personally and publicly, it will be a day when he will return full of glory to the world where he came in humiliation and poverty, with no room for him where other men lay, with none to care for him except in the poorest and meanest form. When he returns in glory, it will be with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God, which is a sign in Scripture of God himself about to do the great and glorious thing. And he will come, says Paul, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. That's the return. And it will be a day of majestic glory. You notice the second thing that is involved in that day, it is the resurrection. Verse 16, the last sentence, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That is, those believers who have died as believers united to Christ will find, now hang on to this, they will find that being united to Christ Jesus, there is nothing in heaven or earth or hell that can divide you from Him. So Paul says, when all things are against us, what shall we say to these things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No, he says. In all these things we are hyper-conquerors. Because nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, neither life nor death, nor things present, nor things to come, and he piles the language up. Because you see that union which has been effected between Christ and the believer is an eternal union. And that's why in death we are not divided from him. In heaven we are with him, and on the day when he returns, he will bring us with him, because you cannot separate the believer from his Savior. 
And on that resurrection day, they who have died in Christ will be raised and given new bodies. Now what we know about these new bodies is limited. But what we do know is that we will have bodies which are like unto his glorious body. And the resurrection body of Jesus is in a very real sense the prototype of the body that we shall have at our resurrection on that day. That's the resurrection. So there's the return and the resurrection. Now look in verse 17. There is the rapture. Now I can almost hear some of you picking up your ears immediately. The rapture. The rapture simply comes from a Latin word which means to snatch or seize. And what it refers to is the snatching up of those who are alive and remain at the coming of Christ to meet the Lord in the air. Notice what Paul says in verse 17. After that, now, there is much discussion and much room for discussion as to how long this interval is. I personally think that it is the same occasion that he is speaking about, but I will certainly not fight you over it. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up with them that is, with believers who have been resurrected in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then there comes the fourth element in what is to happen at the time of our Lord's return. The return, the resurrection, the rapture, and what we might call the reunion. The end of verse 17, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Now that, of course, is the ultimate joy of the return of Christ for the believer. Here he will not just be with Christ spiritually. He will be with him, and our minds are just not equipped to grasp this, but he will be with him in an even more wonderful sense equipped with a new body, a resurrection body, in which to worship and serve and honor and love the Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy Him in an even deeper and more glorious way through all eternity. That's the reunion of which Paul speaks. We will be with the Lord forever. Now you will notice where the joy of that day finds its focus. It finds its focus in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the glory of that day. So there is the coming. Encourage one another, says Paul with these words. Let me ask you to look with me at the other side of this truth in the first part of chapter 5, the day of the Lord. Now, I said at the beginning that this section deals with the whole area of judgment at the return of Christ and the end of the world and the day of the Lord in verse 2 is a day of judgment. Now, the Thessalonian Christians again were asking, what will happen at the end of this age? Is there going to be a judgment? And if so, can we prepare for it? Now, there is no question that Paul frequently speaks of the day of the return of Christ as being principally a day of judgment. You will notice in the very next letter, the second letter to the Thessalonians, 
he speaks of how God is going to judge those who are oppressing the Thessalonian believers. Verse 7, he will give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people, and so on. Now, the Thessalonian Christians were asking, is there going to be such a day of judgment? How can we prepare for it? Now, in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 5, Paul deals with the question of when this day will come. Now, I don't think that they were just asking the question, when will the Lord Jesus Christ come like this in glory? When is it going to happen? I don't think they were asking merely for the sake of idle curiosity, but because they wanted to prepare for it. And I think that's obvious from the rest of what Paul says. But the solution to seeking to be prepared for that day does not lie in knowing the date of the Lord's return. You will know that if someone is coming, we frequently want to know, especially in the Western world, in the Eastern world, it doesn't matter quite so much when people are coming. They come at this day or that day, and you're never very sure when they're coming. But in the West, we want to know. We just don't want to know the day and the date. We want to know the time. When will you come so that we can be properly prepared? But Paul says, the solution to the question of preparedness for the Lord Jesus Christ's return does not lie in knowing the date. It will, in fact, be sudden. Now, notice how he compares it. First of all, in verse 3, like a burglar, unexpected in his arrival, that is, there is no warning. While people are saying peace and safety. Destruction will come upon them. Now that destruction will be first, verse 2, like a thief in the night. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, unexpectedly, with no warning. But you notice the other thing that he says. It is not only like a thief, but like the labor of childbirth, unavoidable, and there is no escape from it. That is, when pregnancy has begun, by and large when things are well, there is no escape from this. That is the figure of speech. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. And what they will not escape from is, of course, judgment. And while the world is congratulating itself on its policies of peace and security, they will discover that the greatest danger that they had never taken account of will come not from the east or from the west, but from above from the God whom they have chosen to ignore and written out of all their thinking and dismissed as insignificant in the modern technological world that is too complicated for that sort of issue to be relevant. They will discover that the real danger doesn't come from east or west. It comes from a God whom they have ignored. Now that's the issue, you see. You can personalize that issue, of course, just when we are at our safest. When we have congratulated ourselves that we have everything for our security. And life is 
under control, as it were, we will discover that the one issue that we had not brought to the forefront of our thinking will be the issue that will send chaos through all our plans. And it will be the coming of the Lord. Now how can we be ready well, Paul explains in verses 4 and 5 that there is no need for Christian believers to be alarmed. Notice what he says in verse 4. You, brothers, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Now, the main reason that the burglar takes us by surprise is that he comes by night under the hiddenness of the darkness. Most people are asleep, not alert. Their self-control is down. Paul even adds, do you notice further on, that they may even be drunken in the night, that is, sleeping a drunken sleep. So people are not ready for the burglar because of darkness and sleep and the things that go with it. Just so with the coming of Christ. People will not be ready if they are in the darkness. Now the question arises, and I need to get you to follow me closely here. Will he come in the light? Or will he come in the dark? The answer is both. For unbelievers, he will come in the darkness. And they will be astonished and appalled. But, says Paul, you brothers are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Now let me explain to you what he is saying. The Bible divides history into two ages. They sometimes are called the present age and the age to come. Sometimes they are called the age of darkness and the age of light. And it's of great significance that in the first chapter of John when Jesus came into the world we read the darkness is passing away. The light is already coming. Now that's the key thing. The two ages, the age that is past and the age that is to come, the age of darkness and the age of light, are overlapping already in these days when Christ has come. Unbelievers live still in the darkness and they walk in the darkness. But for us who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into his most marvelous light. And we therefore walk in the light, and we walk in the day we do not belong to the darkness. Although we still live in a world of darkness. But the day when that overlap will be ended is the day when Christ will return again in glory. And then the darkness will be altogether scattered and vanquished. But in the meantime, you see, if you are a child of God, you do not live in the darkness. 
It will only be if you are living in the darkness as though you had never been translated out of it that the coming of Christ in glory will be a dreaded experience rather than a joyful one. So Paul says, verse 6, verse 5 at the end, we do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Verse 6, so then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled for those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled. How then do we prepare for the coming of Christ? We prepare for the coming of Christ by living as children of the day. What is the mark of children of the day? Well, it's very clear. It's here. The first great mark is self-control. How do you prepare for the coming of the Lord Jesus? How will you be ready as distinct from unready at the day of his coming? Not because you have got a great deal of religious speech. Not because you have got a great reputation in Christian service. But because you are living your life as one who belongs to the day and not to the night. And that's a moral issue. This is moral darkness that he is talking about. And if you say, I am a child of the day, then, my dear friend, what the apostle would say to you is, live as children of the day, and not as children of the night. And the mark of the children of the day is that they put on certain things, verse 8, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Notice, we are to put on faith we are to look upward to God with confidence. We are to put on love. We are to look outward to our fellow men with love and self-giving. We are to put on hope. We are to look forward to day, the day of God with joy. And if we are children of the day, that's how we will clothe ourselves. And what Paul is saying is, don't you call yourself a child of the day if you're living in the darkness of the night. The way to be ready for the Lord's return is quite simply to live as those who belong to the day. Well, now the issue is, as we conclude, do you belong to the day or do you belong to the night? That's the issue. Of which kingdom are you a member? Now you say, oh, well, I can tell you that very easily because on the 23rd of October, 1977, I was born again. I came to a decision to follow Christ. You know, that's great and glorious, but I don't think that's what would impress the Apostle Paul. What would have impressed him would have been whether you had the marks of a child of the day about you. And they are these marks, rather than of someone who belongs to the night. Now, says Paul, verse 9, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. You see what he's saying. It is actually going to be quite a short step 
this rapture? If you are still alive when the Lord Jesus returns in glory, you will be living, whether awake or asleep, you will be living with Him. And He will just come down and say, Come, come up higher, my friend, my child, and be with me forever. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up with these words. May God encourage us by them on this last Sunday evening of 1986 that we may live our whole life as children of the day. And that men and women in the world may see that for us the dawn has already broken and is shining into our hearts. Let us pray. Father, the wonder of all your ways surpasses our understanding. We glory in the mystery of your wisdom and in the wonder of all your ways. And we ask that you will lift our eyes to that day that we may live in the light of it and in the hope of it. For Jesus' sake. Amen.